speak today is my pastor at Grace Community. I think we're all captivated by what he had to say yesterday, so let's hear him close in again. Help me welcome Brooke Simpson. Good morning. No wrestling today. Some of you are disappointed, some of you are glad. Uh, you had time to think about the, the question that I posed yesterday. As, as we close, and that question was this, where is your hope? Where is your hope? Uh, the truth of the matter is, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 is, quite truthfully, one of the more frightening verses in the Bible. I preached this sermon on the Mount about eight years ago uh, as a pastor, and honestly, when I got to Matthew chapter 7, towards the end, uh, that week that I was studying for that, and the coming weeks that I was preparing for that particular passage, it, it was kind of depressing. It was depressing. I, I had to stop and ask myself, how do I know that I know? Could I say, well, I'm a pastor. Of course I know. Well, I'm reading that text, and these guys are saying, but Lord, we cast out demons in your name. We've done miracles in your name. It's like, well, these guys are full-time religious dudes, and they're using his name, and they're quote-unquote ministering in his name. So how do I know that I know? How many of you, honestly, you look at that passage, it kind of freaks you out? Just be honest. Okay, three of you freaks you out. The rest of you are solid. Excellent. Uh, well, I guess you're just a lot more solid than I was as a pastor of 10 years because it freaked me out. And I think it's important that as we look at what Paul said to examine ourselves to see if we're truly in the faith, that we don't presume that we are. Now, on the one hand, you can know. Because the scriptures are very clear that you can know that you know. But the question is, how do you know? And what do you know? And do you believe it? And is your belief academic? Or is your belief uh, more than head knowledge, but it's also heart knowledge that translates into a changed life? That's what we're going to be looking at today and also tomorrow. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we look at these things, uh, Father, we ask that your spirit would be the teacher uh, today. And we ask, Lord, that... Uh, you would open up hearts, open up minds, and help me to teach and to preach with your power, your glory, that Christ might be exalted. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I'm going to give you a couple, uh, couple of things that people tend to put their hope in. And you may not have heard these terms, but this is pretty common. If you're, if you're talking to a bunch of people that come from a religious background, and you ask them, okay, where's your hope? How do you know that you know? How do you know that you're in with God? How do you know that you'll be accepted? Uh, they won't use this term, but it's what they mean. And the term is moralism. Moralism is the idea that God has given us his commands, and Jesus, in fact, has come to exemplify those commands, and that if we obey those commands, and if we try to be like Jesus, then that will make us somehow right with God. That's what Jesus dealt with when he interacted with the Pharisees. And that's honestly what all world religions are about. All world religions and Christianity, when you twist it and you extract and remove the gospel from it, all world religions teach the following. Here's the guidelines. Keep them. Be this kind of person. And God will love you. How many of you, and I want an honest response here. How many of you when you feel like you don't measure up to God's standards, feel as if you're not accepted by God. Have you ever had that feeling? Okay. At least a few of you. That, that's a moralism feeling. That's an idea that God accepts me on the basis of my performance. So some people put their hope in that. Some people put their hope in, I, I, I obey the commands. God's given me the right way to live, and I'm trying to obey those things, and, and that's what makes me right with God. Now, that's not everybody. Some people are into tribalism. Tribalism. I don't, tribalism. I'm not an American Indian. I'm not in Africa. I don't get it. It means you identify with a crowd, a religious denomination, and by virtue of the fact that you identify with a majority of people who you see as pretty good people, well, because you're a part of that group, because you're a part of the Mennonite community, because you're part of the Baptist community, because you're part of the Catholic community, because you're part of the Islamic community, fill in the blank, somehow 
by identifying with the masses, it's kind of like whistling in the dark. And you go, how many of you are freaked out by cemeteries? All right? But if you go through the cemetery with a group of people, it's not quite as bad, is it? Why? Well, if the zombies come, you won't die alone. <laughs> okay? It's, it's, but there is no hope. There's no hope in tribalism. Identifying with a bunch of people that got it wrong doesn't make it any more right. And moralism, it doesn't deliver either. Uh, Martin Luther, how many of you heard of Martin Luther? Okay, Martin Luther, uh, one of the founders of the Reformation, uh, he was a Catholic monk before he was the uh, founder or the uh, spark that lit the Reformation. He was a Catholic monk and he desired to be right with God. And as he was studying the scriptures, as he was studying the scriptures, he became actually more and more and more troubled and he actually fell into despair because the more he read the scriptures he understood very clearly what Hebrews chapter 12 says. Hebrews chapter 12 says without holiness no one will see the Lord. Now if you're at all paying attention that's troubling. Without holiness no one sees the Lord. Do you know what holiness is? Holiness is perfection. Holiness means that you've been set apart You've been pulled out of the mire and you've been set apart to live differently. Peter says, as, as God is holy, so we are to be holy. And he's quoting Leviticus. This is not a New Testament thing. It's not an Old Testament thing. It's a Testament thing. We're called to be holy. And the New Testament says, if you're not holy, you won't see the Lord. Now, how many of you think you're holy? Don't raise your hand. Think that through. And Luther was reading the scriptures, and as he read the scriptures, he became more and more freaked out because he'd look in the mirror and he'd say, the guy's not holy. I know him. He's me. And I know the standard. I'm supposed to love my enemies as myself? I want to punch my enemies in the mouth. I'm supposed to not have lustful thoughts? I see a young girl walking by and I think things I'm not supposed to think. Jesus says that you've heard that it was said that if you commit adultery, you'd be subject to judgment, and then Jesus drops this one. If you look at a woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery in your heart. You've heard it was said that you shall not murder. If you murder, you'd be subject to judgment. I tell you, if you're angry with your brother, you've committed murder in your heart. Luther understood that. Luther understood that holiness is not about just not dancing. <laughs> and it's not just about not smoking or not drinking. It's about purification about, at a heart level, which includes attitudes. And Luther, the harder and harder he tried, the more he realized, I can't get this right. And here's this big standard. Be holy, be perfect, and then you're in. I hope to God that none of you think that you're perfect. And if you do, I pray that the Holy Spirit would open your eyes to show you the requirements of the law so that he would break you. Because you're not holy. I'm not holy. I'm an imperfect guy, just like Luther was. And Luther began actually to despise God. He actually began to resent him. It's like, this is so unfair. You want me to be holy as you are holy. Yet I'm not holy. And I don't see any way I can become holy. You're demanding that I become righteous. And that's the standard. Be like Jesus. WWJD. I don't know that Luther wore that bracelet, but that's the idea, isn't it? How many of you have a WWJD bracelet? What's it mean? What would Jesus do? Do you do what Jesus does or would have done? Of course you will sometimes, but your heart, your hearts are you're predisposed not to. And Luther began to despair, and he began to try to do all of these things that the, 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 the Catholic Church at that time said, if you do this, this will offset your unrighteousness. And, and he realized it was all a bunch of bunk. And he became frustrated until he came upon one particular passage in the book of Romans. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 1. If you didn't bring your Bibles, listen very carefully. Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. The Apostle Paul says to the church in Rome, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for the salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and then the Gentile. For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by 
faith. All of this time, what Luther had thought that he was supposed to do was do these things which, which, which look like what Christ did and don't do the things which Christ wouldn't do. So Luther had the WWJD bracelet on and that was the basis of his hope. But he couldn't do what Jesus did. He couldn't fix his heart to be like Jesus' heart. And then all of a sudden he's reading the Apostle Paul and he comes to this passage in Romans and he sees that righteousness is not a matter of action, although there are actions, we'll get to that tomorrow. It's a matter of faith. And he's, he, faith, what is faith in what? What does Paul say? I'm not ashamed of the what? The gospel. Because the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. That's significant. First for the Jew. First for the religious people. First for the people who had the law. First for the people who had religious tradition. First for the people who knew what the standard of righteousness is. This righteousness that comes by faith, which is through the gospel, this is for religious people. Sometimes religious people think that the gospel's for who? The pagans. People like me. They grew up the way I did. And it is, because it's first for the Jew, that is the religious people that grew up in a religious traditional home. But it's also for the irreligious, the Gentiles, who have no moral background. You know what my standards were of righteousness? Don't kill someone. That was about the extent of my morality. If I could step over that bar, I thought I was doing pretty good. Okay, I didn't have all of these other things. So in my own mind, I thought it was pretty good. But the gospel isn't just for, 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 for the wicked sinners, the irreligious. It's also for the seemingly righteous religious kids. It's for both. It's for both. The gospel levels the field. It's for everybody. Everybody has to attain this righteousness, not by their own acts of, uh, of or good deeds or their good works. They have to receive this righteousness through the gospel. Now that begs the question, what is the gospel? The word gospel, anybody have any idea what that means? It means good news. It means good news. It's, it's a proclamation, a herald, or a, that's a, a word we don't use anymore. We don't even have them anymore. We have Twitter and, and, uh, and the internet. So uh, a herald was someone that came before you had Twitter. And, and the herald would rush into the community and he would stand on a platform and he would announce some significant event. The war is over. We've won. The king has been crowned. Or he would announce something bad. But this is good news. So a herald comes and says, good news. You all are required to be holy. You know that you're not. But there's a way that you can be. <laughs> And he explains all through Romans chapter 1, chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, 10, and 11. He explains in 11 chapters what the gospel is. And some of you are thinking, Brooks, you got 10 minutes. I'm pretty sure you're not going to get through 11 chapters of Romans. I'm not going to try. I'm going to give you a basic overview of what the gospel is so that you understand what it is. Paul says it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. When I was a, a, a young college student and I was dating my wife, actually she wasn't my wife at the time, she would have been my girlfriend, she became my wife, she asked me to go to church with her after a while, we dated for some time, she was like you, she grew up in a religious home, a traditional uh, evangelical home, she got to college and, and went crazy and, and kind of dove into immorality and that's where she met me at the bottom of the cesspool at the University of Iowa. And, uh, but we dated for a while, and she said, I want to start going to church. And I said, okay. So we went. And she asked me this question. She said, are you saved? And I had no idea what she was talking about. I said, what do you mean? And she said, if you died today, do you know if you'd go to heaven? I said, well, yeah. She says, well, on what basis? I said, uh, I believe in God. And I believe that Jesus was his son. I knew enough. I knew what Christmas was about. I mean, we did have a Christmas tree. Uh, I, I kind of got that. I didn't have any idea what any of that meant. But that's what I said. She says, well, there's more to it than that. And I said, what do you mean? And so she explained what I'm about to explain, not in the same way. But basically, she told me that Christ died on the cross for my sins. And I had to receive him as my Savior. And I said, well, yeah, that's what I believe. I had no idea what she's talking about. I just wanted the conversation to end. It was uncomfortable. 
Okay? So that's where I was at. So here's what salvation is. Salvation from what? What are we saved from? Paul says it's the, the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. But saved from what? The short answer to that, that you would, you're going to learn as you go through Romans chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, is that we're saved from sin. Sin is a... We think we know what sin is. When you think of sinners, you, think, you tend to think of people... Um, oh, if you're in Cologne, you think of people who live in Iowa City. Right? <laughs> Be honest. It's, you've been to the pet mall. It's those people. Those people are the sinners. And that's not an incorrect answer, but it's also these people. It's, also, it's all of us. The, the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The word sin means, in, in a Greek, amartia, it means to miss the mark. It means to miss the mark. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Now, here's a question. How many of you are actually aiming at the mark? Seriously. Paul says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That assumes you're trying to hit the mark. Do you honestly, can you say what Jesus said? Here's what Jesus said. I live to do the will of my Father in heaven. Do you live to do the will of the Father in heaven? Is that all you ever think about, your Father's will? I seriously doubt it. See, that's what sin is. It's a disposition that says, I don't want my Father's will. I want my will. I want to do what I want to do, and I want to do with whomever I want to do it with. That's what sin says. Sin despises authority. Sin doesn't like the authority of your teachers. Sin doesn't like the authority of your parents. Sin doesn't ultimately like the authority of God. Sin wants what sin wants. And Paul says, we're all predisposed to want what we want. And we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And here's the deal. The wages of sin, Paul says in Romans 6.23, is death. That means separation from God. The reason that no one who's not holy will not ever see the Lord is because you can only be holy and dwell in His presence. If you think of it like God being fire and sin being gas, they don't mix. You will be consumed. The author of Hebrews says our God is a consuming fire and sin is kindling. It's dry wood. You can't dwell in the presence of a consuming fire if sin is presence. And so sin is a separation from God. It separates us from God. That's why Paul says the wages of sin is death. And that's not just physical death. That's eternal separation. You will not be nearing God's presence now. You will not be in God's presence 20 years from now. You won't be in God's presence in eternity. And the definition of eternity without God's presence is what? It's hell. That's a difficult subject, and it's a difficult thing to think about, but it's true nonetheless. So the gospel saves us from sin's penalty, that is the separation that we have with God currently, and if, we're, if that's not remedied forever, it also delivers us from sin's power. Jesus told the Pharisees that they were slaves to sin. They said, we're not slaves to sin. We've never been slaves to anyone. We're the children of Abraham. Ignoring the fact that they were currently under Roman occupation and that they had been slaves many, many times historically to the Babylonians, to the Assyrians, to the Egyptians. So I'm not sure how they missed those significant historical markers when they said we've never been slaves to anyone. But Jesus is saying, that's not my point. He says anyone who sins is a slave to sin. What does that mean? You're a slave to your desires. Some of you know exactly what you ought to do and you don't do it. And why don't you do what you ought to do? Because your desires lead you elsewhere. Is that true? Is that true for every human being? We're slaves to our desires. Even when we know the good that we ought to do, we still do the thing that we don't want and we know we shouldn't do. Why? Because we're slaves. We're slaves to the power of sin. It's like a chain. It's like a rope that's tied us and we can't get free of it. The gospel delivers us from the power of sin. It also ultimately delivers us from the presence of sin. The gospel delivers us from the presence of sin. Now, here's the, I got, I got five minutes here, four minutes. Uh-oh. I got ten minutes? Awesome. Sweet. I am going to cover the 11th chapter of Romans. <laughs> How does the gospel save us from sin? How? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. The apostle Paul writes these words. He who knew no sin Who's that? Jesus. Okay. I'm glad you didn't raise your hand and say me. Okay. He who knew no sin, that is Jesus, became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. We call that the great exchange. That's the gospel. It's the essence of the gospel. 
What Luther discovered when he was reading Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he says that the, 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 I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Here's what, here's what Luther discovered as he's reading Romans. Okay? The, the person of Jesus Christ, he's God. You learn that in chapter 1, verses 4, 5, and 6 of Romans. You also learn that throughout the Holy Testament. He's God, but he, comes, he becomes man. Now, he lived only to do the will of his Father in heaven. He's never sinned. He's totally righteous. He's only done that which his Father asked him to do. And he submitted himself to the cross. He submitted himself to the cross, and he takes your sins and my sins upon himself. Jesus takes our sin. He takes our sin. Now, Think this through. Christ takes your sin. That's the reason he dies. He dies in your stead. What do we deserve? What do you and I deserve? Yeah. Wrath. We deserve wrath. The wages of sin is death. Separation from God. That's what I've earned. The wages of sin is death. A wage is something you earn. If you don't receive your wage, it's not just. So if God does not pay that penalty, if he does not pay that thing that we earned, God is no longer just. But he does pay that which we earned. He does pour out his wrath upon his own son. Why did he do that? Because he's mad at his son? No, but be because sin demands payment. And Christ is that payment. Christ goes to the cross. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. So Christ takes our sin. But it's, and that's why, that's why when we trust Christ, when you come to God and you say, Lord God, I'm a sinner, save me from my sins, I trust in Christ's atoning work, what happens is a transaction. Your sins go to Him. And therefore, if you keep reading, and you keep reading in Romans chapter 3, Paul says later, and Luther discovered this, that although... All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. We are justified freely by His grace through faith. We're justified. In other words, we're declared not guilty. When God looks at us, if we have trusted Christ, He declares us not guilty. Why? You say, how can you declare me not guilty? I'm guilty. Because Christ has paid the penalty for our sin. But it's more than that. Most of you, raise your hand if you're like, yeah, I've heard this whole thing about Jesus on the cross dying for a sin. Anybody heard of that? Of course you have. Go to IMS. You don't learn that at West High or City High. Uh, you're not going to learn that in the classroom at, uh, at Mid Prairie, but you're going to learn it here. But what does it even mean? It's more than just God taking your sins and putting them on, the, on, the, on Jesus. It's more than that. It, it's, it's bigger than that. He also gives you his righteousness. He gives to you his righteousness. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Okay? I want you to think of it this way. Think of it this way. How many of you someday plan to get married? All right, most of you. Now, um, I need two volunteers. Well, I'm not even going to ask for a volunteer. You two, come here. You're sitting in the front row. You're easy prey. All right. What's your name? Lane. Lane is now Jesus. Right. And what's your name? Grace. Grace. Perfect. We have, we have, uh, we have Jesus and Grace. You can't even... It's God set this match up in heaven. All right. All right. So... Unfortunately, Grace here is, like all of us, she's sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Right? And the wages of sin is death. She's screwed. There's, there's no other way around it. That's all that she's toast. There's nothing she can do. She tries to keep the commands. She finds herself wanting to disobey the commands. So she is, in, in, in theological terms, a debtor. She has a sin debt. If, if sin was a, was a, if sin is, it is debt. If you think of debt like commercial debt, like uh, consumer debt, her credit cards are all maxed out. So when she goes to the Coral Ridge Mall, you've been to Coral Ridge Mall? Yeah. Of course you have. When she walks into, what's your favorite store? Shields. Shields. When she walks into Shields, alarms go off. <laughs> and all of the, uh, all the attendants come out and they escort her, Grace. You're not welcome here. We know that you're a debtor. You have no credit here. And all of a sudden, the creditors start coming after her, and, she, and they're saying, you pay your bills or you're going to go bankrupt. You pay your bills or you're going to jail. That's all of you. That's me. That's all of us, right? So the wages of her debt are bankruptcy. Now, spiritually speaking, the wages of sin is death. 
and hell and God's wrath. And it's what Grace deserves because she's been running up her credit card. She knows better, but she can't help it. She's a slave to her desire for, for sporting goods equipment <laughs> and, and, and athletic apparel. She's, she's a slave to that. She can't be free of that. But here's Jesus. He's so <laughs> handsome. And they, they meet and they fall in love and, and, and they, they, they're like both fighting. <laughs> <laughs> they get closer together and, and he woos her. And he confesses his love for her and all this mushy stuff. And, and she falls in love with him. Uh, and he falls in love with her, not on the basis of her attractiveness, although Grace is a beautiful young woman here, but on the basis of his father's love. And he reaches out to her and he, he asks her to, 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 to join him in matrimony, to, to unite, to be one. Now here's what happens. What does she have? over her head. Death. All right? That's you and I. What does he have? Righteousness. He's debt free. He's not a slave to sin. He's never used a credit card. He pays cash and cash only. <laughs> he is, uh, what is that guy's name? Alpha. What's the guy on the radio? Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey. Okay. He's Dave Ramsey with hair. And he's Jesus, who's so got money and righteousness. Right? So he is all of those awesome things, okay? Now, when they get married, hold hands, please. Okay, do this. This is not holding hands. There you go. All right, here we go. Now they are, are, are they're in matrimony. They're married. And the scriptures say that the two become one flesh, all right? What happens to her debt? It doesn't go away. He assumes it. If you get married to someone who's in debt, you get their debt. That's how it works. So he gets her debt. And what's the price of her debt? Death. He gets to pay the penalty. But that's half the deal. That's half the deal. Her debt's now been paid. What does she get? His righteousness. Do you understand that the gospel is not just a get out of jail free card? The gospel is when you accept Christ and you receive him and the father looks at grace now, here's what the father sees. He sees a holy, righteous bride. Because what Jesus did was not just take her debt. What Jesus did was take her debt and bestow upon her his righteousness. That's what Luther discovered. The righteousness that comes by faith, not by works. Do you, do you let that soak in just for a minute? When God looks at grace, if she has trusted Christ, regardless of the credit card bill of sin that she's run up, what God sees is the righteousness of his own son in grace's heart. That's the gospel. That has absolutely nothing to do with anything grace has ever done. You see that? That's the great exchange. That's, that's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Give these guys a hand. Thank you. Now, that's the gospel. That's the gospel. But here's the question. That, theologians call that imputed righteousness. It's, it's an alien righteousness. In other words, it's righteousness that's from outside of us. We didn't create it. Grace didn't create it. She just received it. How did she receive it? By grace. You can't even make this stuff up. I didn't, I didn't even know who she was. I just pulled her out. How do you receive right, God's righteousness? Paul says in Romans or in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, it is by grace through faith. Anybody named Faith here? That would have even been better. It's by grace through faith that you've been saved. And this is not of works, so that nobody can boast. The word grace, it means gift. It's unmerited favor. That's the basis. So the, the answer to the question, where's your hope? You say, totally on the grace of God. Totally on the grace of God. Some of you are like, well, where's my righteousness come into that? I thought I had to be holy. You are positionally holy. When God looks at you, if you have received Christ by grace through faith, 
what God sees in you is the righteousness of his son. And you say, but I still sin. That's been taken and separated as far as from the east as the west. That's why the apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 8 verse 1, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For those who are in, who are wed, who are one with, there is no condemnation. You say, but Brooks, you don't understand with what I struggle with. I don't care what you struggle with. Your debt has been paid. Regardless of how great that debt. Now tomorrow we're going to look at what that entails. What that entails. But understand the basis of the gospel has nothing to do with your external works. It has everything to do with your seeing your need of Christ. Now, we're going to close, because I do have to close, with this. Have you received that grace through faith? Have you received that unmerited favor? If at all you are thinking, my hope is based upon my identification with IMS, or my church, or my denomination, or I keep the commandments, you have not received grace, you are banking on your works, and the debtors will come calling, and the wages of sin is death. You can either join Christ and say, God, I am a sinner, save me from my sins, or you can pay the bill on your own. And you can't pay the bill. You will never attain righteousness. You will never be forgiven unless you receive the love that Christ has to offer, and there's no cost to you. He pays all of that. The Apostle John said in John chapter 1, Yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. You were not born children of God because you're in a Mennonite school. You were not born children of God because your mom and dad taught you Bible stories. Nobody is born a child of God. We're born dead in our transgressions and sins. We are reborn when we see that we're debtors. And we see that Christ is a benefactor who desires to give us his righteousness and take from us our debt. Yet to all who received him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. How do you become a child of God? You just simply cry out to him. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 10, Yet to all who call on him, to those who believe in his name, to all who call on the Lord, they will be saved. How do you do that? You just recognize, Lord Jesus, I'm a debtor. I'm one of those good religious kids, or I'm one of those kids that seems religious, but I'm faking it. I'm one of those kids who struggle with porn. I'm one of those kids who's this, who's that. I just, I just know I'm not righteous and I need you to save me. You know what he says? This is done, deal. I'm here. Let's do this thing. Let's do this thing. You be my bride. I'll be your groom. And some of you guys are like, I don't like the femininity of it. Whatever. Get over yourself. You're not all that masculine anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's a metaphor. It's about being united with Christ, receiving his righteousness, and letting him take your sin. I'm going to ask you to pray with me, and if it's your desire, and you're like, I've never received Christ, but I'd like to, I'd like you to pray with me. <coughs> and, then, and then tomorrow, we're going to talk about, okay, what's this look like now that, now that I'm in? Now that I'm in, now that I'm with Christ, how do I work this out? How do I know that I know, because I still am not real sure about this, how do I grow? How do I grow and how do I know? That's tomorrow. Let's pray. If someone wants to pray along with me and they just want to receive Christ, I just pray that you would pray with me silently. Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner and you're a Savior. Thank you for sending your son Jesus. Thank you for the fact that he has taken our debt to the cross. Thank you that he offers us his righteousness and it's not anything that I do. And I just confess to you I'm a sinner and I need your grace. Lord, I need your grace. I believe that you died on the cross. I believe that you rose again. I'm asking you to save me from my sin and make me the kind of person you want me to be. Lord, I thank you for the gospel. It's the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. First for the Mennonite religious guy and the irreligious guy who graduated from the University of Iowa. Lord, I thank you that the gospel is free. I thank you that it's available to all. 